What is it that you personally cannot do? What comes to your mind? Maybe several things. In my case, I think of not being able to sing very well. Perhaps you can relate. Maybe you think of other things. Maybe not being able to cook well or being able to swim or ride a bicycle or drive a car. Uh, we all have some limitations. And typically, we avoid, we hesitate in telling others of what we are not able to do. However, Jehovah God, the most powerful personage in the world, in the universe, does not hesitate to tell us what he cannot do. He inspired the Apostle Paul to write it in the Bible. And we'd like to invite you, please, to look up Titus chapter 1. Under inspiration, the Apostle Paul mentions what God cannot do. It says, that's chapter 1 of Titus, verse 2. And is based on a hope of the everlasting life that God who cannot lie promised long ago. So God cannot lie. He's never lied and never will. Now, according to some sources, the average person lies about two times every day. So in a year's time, that's hundreds of lies. But Jehovah God has never done it. He makes and he keeps all his promises. He's not a promise breaker. As a matter of fact, uh, every word that Jehovah says is truth. Uh, his own son in prayer, according uh, to John seventeen seventeen, says, your word is truth. Therefore, Jehovah's original purpose for mankind to live forever on a paradise earth will come true. Now, you likely are acquainted with Adam and Eve and their rebellion in the Garden of Eden. And uh, they lost their life and also the, their offspring, as a result, lost their life. But Jehovah has not changed his purpose for mankind. It will come true. He is the God who cannot lie. Now, understandably, this may be hard to believe when we see the conditions worldwide. Uh, death is seen on a large scale with pandemics, sicknesses, natural disasters, and so on. And sadly, because of this, many have lost their faith in God. So here's a question. In view of these present conditions, can we still trust in God's promises made a long time ago? As mentioned in the theme of this talk, can we really exercise faith in God? Some say yes, others say no. And the answer really depends on whether we believe God or not when he says that he cannot lie. This talk will strengthen our faith, our trust in God. So, where should we start? Well, think of a sports event and a controversial play occurs. And then there's two teams. One team says, well, it happened this way. And then the players of the other team say, no, it happened this way. How do we come to the truth? How do we know what the truth is? Well, nowadays, in many of these games, they have a video replay. And only when you see that video replay in slow motion can you decipher, determine what really happened. And the referee who knows the rules of the game can make the right decision. Well, let's go over a condensed replay, so to speak, of what happened after that rebellion in the Garden of Eden. And as we do, we need to remember the rule. We read it in Titus 1-2. God cannot lie. So, to begin the replay, let's go to the very beginning in the book of Genesis. Please turn your Bibles there to Genesis. Now, Titus 1-2 mentioned that God promised something a long time ago. And let's look at one of these promises in uh, verse 15 in particular. That's chapter 3, verse 15. Uh, you may want to put a bookmark here because we will be returning to this particular promise found in Genesis 3.15. It reads, And I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your offspring and her offspring. He will crush your head, and you will strike him in the heel. Now, we refer to this as the Edenic promise, because it was uttered in the Garden of Eden. 
And as you know, every promise has a story behind it. And many times knowing the story makes us appreciate the promise even more. So what's the story behind this promise in Genesis? Well, Adam and Eve disobeyed Jehovah. They rejected God as their ruler. Uh, This started the rebellion in the Garden of Eden. And now Satan challenged Jehovah's right to rule. In effect, made him look a lot like a liar in front of Adam and Eve and in front of all the spirit creatures in heaven. So how would Jehovah respond to this, to his challenge? Well, immediately after the rebellion, he makes a promise. Uh, we just read it in Genesis 3.15. Basically, a promise to undo everything that Satan was planning uh, to cause for mankind. He's basically saying everything will be all right. Um, I have my solution. My purpose will not change. After all, I cannot lie. So, in connection with this prophecy, let's look at it again. Genesis 3.15, and let's briefly review it. You notice... Uh, Who is speaking? Well, the pronoun I refers to Jehovah. To whom is he speaking? There's a you. Uh, This is Satan disguised as a serpent. Now, what was the promise? Well, part of it is I will put enmity. So there's a judgment against Satan and his offspring, which is all those rebellious ones that are on his side. Now, he introduces, Jehovah introduces two more participants, the woman and her offspring. Who's the woman? Well, it's definitely not Eve who rejected God. This is referring to Jehovah's heavenly organization uh, collectively of all the spirit creatures. In the Bible, Scripture refers to that collection as a woman. Who's the offspring? Who's her, her offspring? Well, since the mother is composed of spirit creatures, it would make sense that the offspring would also be a spirit creature. And we can also conclude this since the offspring crushes the head of Satan, who is a spirit creature. Now, you notice that expression, crush your head. Uh, That describes a very traumatic injury. It's basically telling us that Satan will be destroyed. What an outstanding promise. That's good news. Uh, What does this promise teach us about Jehovah? He doesn't give up easily on mankind. He didn't give up on us, did he? He knew that some would put faith and exercise that faith in him. And then he lovingly now uh, declares this prophetic solution to keep with his original purpose. Now, there are a couple of details not included there in the verse. For example, when would this crushing of the head take place? And who would be the offspring to do the crushing? Well, the answers to these questions were a secret for a long time. As a matter of fact, the Bible refers to it as a sacred secret. But Jehovah, though he was alone and knowing all the details, he's he's a God of love. So he wants to reveal the details, and he did so progressively. Throughout the centuries, Jehovah made a number of what the Bible refers to as covenants or agreements with faithful men. And each of these covenants provided more details as to the identity of that offspring mentioned in Genesis 3.15. For example, about 2,000 years after that rebellion in Eden, Jehovah makes a covenant with the faithful man Abraham. It's found here in Genesis chapter 22. If you can turn there, please. Genesis chapter 22. But before we read the promise, remember, there's always a story behind every promise. So what's the story here? Well, Abraham proved faithful to Jehovah. Remember how? He was obedient to a very challenging request from Jehovah God. Not a matter of not eating from a tree, but much more difficult. To sacrifice his son, his only son, Isaac. And he was obedient. He was about to sacrifice him. An angel stops him. Now, because of that willingness, that obedience, uh, Jehovah now adds a a promise, makes a promise, a covenant with him, and in that covenant provides more details in connection with the promise in Genesis 3.15. Let's read it together. These are words from Jehovah to Abraham, and that's why they're uh, referred to as the Abrahamic covenant. It's a promise with Abraham. 
Verse 18, Genesis 22, 18. And by means of your offspring, all nations of the earth will obtain a blessing for themselves because you have listened to my voice. Now, what's the new detail here in this promise that Jehovah provides? Well, the offspring mentioned, Genesis 3.15, basically would come from Abraham's family line. That's the thought. So this meant that the offspring would be a human, at least at some point. Now, there's another important detail here with that expression, all nations. So his promise was not just with Abraham or his descendants, uh, his children, but with all nations, which falls in line with the thought that when he created that paradise earth, it was for all mankind who exercised faith in him. Well, in time, Jehovah made another agreement or another covenant, this time with the descendants of Abraham, the Israelites. But first, remember the story. Well, Jehovah delivers the Israelites from slavery in Egypt and uh, protects them right through the Red Sea. A miracle takes place. And Jehovah then afterwards makes a covenant with them to be his special possession, his special people. And this is referred to as the Law Covenant, basically a national law code with over 600 laws. What did that accomplish? Well, many good things. It made them feel good, secure, protected. Um, there was a structure of theocratic laws, and it taught them the need to always give their very best to their God. And principally, the purpose of this covenant was to protect the lineage of that offspring mentioned in Genesis 3.15. Let's consider one last covenant. And this one is in Psalm 89. Please turn there. Psalm 89. Now, Jehovah makes this covenant with King David. And here again, he's providing some additional details in connection with that offspring, that promise in Genesis. Uh, but before we read the promise, uh, what's the story? Do you remember? Well, a kingdom was set up over Israel. Actually, the Israelites uh, wanted, they requested to be like the other nations around them and have their own king. Eventually, the king became King David, a person that was agreeable to Jehovah's heart, a good man. And now Jehovah makes a promise with him. So that's the story. Let's read the promise. That's Psalm 89, and we'll start with verse 34. I will not violate my covenant or change what my lips have spoken. I have sworn in my holiness once and for all. I will not tell lies to David. Oh, in these two verses, uh, Jehovah gives the reassurance of what he cannot do. He cannot lie. And that uh, is reassuring in connection with that promise in Genesis 3.15. It's unbreakable. Now let's continue. Verse 36 and 37. His offspring, that's David's offspring, will endure forever. His throne will endure like the sun before me, like the moon. It will be firmly established forever as a faithful witness in the skies. So what are the additional details that Jehovah reveals with this promise, this covenant? Well, in verse 36, he mentions King David's throne. And where there's a throne, there's a king, and there's a kingdom. So the promise of Genesis 3.15 involves a kingdom. And the offspring would be a king in David's uh, lineage. Now, how long would this kingdom last? Well, you notice it says it will endure like the sun and like the moon. In other words, uh, what that king and kingdom accomplishes will last forever. Very reassuring. So as you can see, the sacred secret was progressively being disclosed. Each detail, each clue were like the strokes of an artist on a white canvas. The picture of the promise was becoming clear with time. Now, can you recall the four promises from Jehovah that we just briefly reviewed? Well, you had the Edenic promise, the Abrahamic covenant, the law covenant, and then also the promise covenant with King David. 
Now, that was just a brief replay, so to speak. Uh, there are other covenants, but these are key ones. And what do they teach us? What do these four covenants teach us? Jehovah never forgets a promise, even if he made it a very long time ago. He is determined to remember and to keep his promise. Having that in mind, please note what Matthew chapter 1 now and verse 1 mention. And this is a key scripture after our review, our brief review and replay. Because here uh, we see how Jehovah discloses the name of the offspring mentioned in Genesis 3.15. Let's read this together. That's Matthew chapter 1, verse 1. The book of the history of Jesus Christ, son of David, son of Abraham. So that promise offspring, as we've discussed with the covenants, was going to be a son of Abraham, son of David. But now the specific name is given, Jesus Christ. That's the principal part of the promise offspring in, mentioned in Genesis 3.15. Now, let's return to Genesis 3.15 just to review a couple of more important details. That's uh, Genesis 3.15. Do you remember what would happen to the offspring? Well, it mentions, uh, if you notice, the last sentence of that verse that he, uh, the offspring, now we know it's Jesus, it says, will crush your head and you will strike him in the heel. Have you ever been injured in your heel? That's painful, bothersome. However, it's not fatal. Uh, we usually recover from that type of injury. So what was our God of prophecy illustrating with that expression? Well, please turn now to 1 Peter chapter 3. 1 Peter chapter 3, and we'll read verse 18. Because the thought here is that it would not be a, a permanent injury. Jesus' death would not be permanent. Let's read this together. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 18. Do you have that? It says, For Christ died once for all time for sins, a righteous person for unrighteous ones, in order to lead you to God. He was put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit. So Jesus was struck in the heel when he was put to death, but was made alive in the spirit with the resurrection. So this made his death appear as a mere striking of the heel. Now, now in heaven, Jesus uh, wants to prove again that his father cannot lie. He is eager to crush the serpent's head. And how would this be done? Well, as the offspring, he's now the king of God's kingdom. And as a king, he has the authority now to do that fatal crushing. And this is confirmed in the last book of the Bible, Revelation. We'd like you to please turn to Revelation chapter 12 and verse 10. Now, in this verse, uh, we'll read two important events that took place in heaven. Revelation 12:10 reads, I heard a loud voice in heaven say, Now have come to pass the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ, because the accuser of our brothers has been hurled down, who accuses them day and night before our God. Did you notice at least two important events? One, Jesus here is receiving the authority in Jehovah's kingdom. And second, Satan is thrown out of heaven. Both of these events took place in 1914, according to Bible prophecy. Therefore, Christ is now ruling as king with the authority to crush Satan's head. And he's patiently waiting for that perfect time when Jehovah tells him to fulfill uh, his promise that was made a long time ago. And isn't that what we're all waiting for? We're looking forward to the fulfillment of that prophecy, the vindication of Jehovah's sovereignty. We want to enjoy that original purpose of living forever on earth, on a paradise earth. You know, that paradise scene seems distant at times and maybe a little foggy and unclear like uh, this painting. Uh, we sort of see it, but it's a little foggy. 
but we're confident, see, because Jehovah cannot lie. He will eliminate all the fog. He will eliminate Satan, his offspring, and then we'll enjoy this beautiful paradise on earth. Uh, we believe it because we remember the rule, God cannot lie. Therefore, in view of what we've considered, be assured you can be certain that Jehovah will always keep his promises towards you and fulfill them beyond all expectations. The more you learn about Jehovah, the more your faith, the more your love grows. And what a beautiful thought. Our love for Jehovah can grow as we gain more knowledge about him and his beautiful personality. Uh, just as a simple illustration, as an example, think of a man who, for the first time, declares his love towards his girlfriend. That's a special moment. And he tells her, I appreciate you. I've come to love you. Uh, those words, I love you. Now, why is he able to declare that? Well, he's gotten to know her. See, he's gained knowledge about her, her personality. He's seen her with her family in different settings. And now he comes to that conclusion, I love you. But how about if she doesn't respond in the same way? And maybe she'll say, well, thank you. That's very nice. I appreciate you too. What happened? Well, apparently she was not ready uh, to declare her love. Maybe she still needs to get to know him a little better to reach firmly that feeling and, and love towards him. Hopefully she will. But what's the point? Uh, Jehovah is always the first to say, I love you. He's the first one to express that to us. The question is, how do we respond? Do we think, well, yeah, that's nice and that's good. Or are we in love, so to speak, with Jehovah? See, the way we get to love Jehovah, not just intellectually, because it's the right thing to do, but because we feel it. We love him and his person and his personality is by getting to know him. See, the more knowledge we acquire, uh, we'll get to feel that feeling of love. We get to know him by reading the Bible. We get to know him by creation. We connect the dots and his qualities. We pray to Jehovah regularly. We see his response to our prayers. And yes, we study the Bible. So learning about God increases our love for him. And that also helps us to make changes in our life for the better. He will never let you down. Just as an example, let me share a brief experience about Israel Martinez. Uh, he struggled with feelings of inferiority, self-worth. He explains that when he was little, he, his father became an alcoholic, and that affected his uh, family life very negatively. He says this, uh, as children, we started smoking cigarettes when I was just six years old. I got drunk for the first time. When I was 10, a man invited me to work with him at the city garbage dump. I accepted the offer, quit school, left home. Well, four years later, he got so depressed, he had suicidal thoughts. And then one evening, he prays to God and he makes a promise. This is the prayer. Lord, if you exist, I want to get to know you, and I will serve you forever. If there's a true religion, I want to know it. What happened? You guessed it. A Jehovah's Witness approached him, offered a Bible study. He accepted it. He's made tremendous changes, so much that he serves now as a traveling overseer of Jehovah's Witnesses. Israel concludes his experience saying this, I overcame my deeply rooted inferiority complex. Thanks to the Bible's healing effect and the excellent education that God gives us, I no longer feel ashamed of myself. See, Bible education helped change his life. He grew in his love towards his father Jehovah by learning more about him. This man's faith in God and his love for him motivated him to make a promise to him, to dedicate himself to God. That's what he promised in the prayer, and he fulfilled that promise, and he's happy now. You can do the same. See, dedicating ourselves, our lives to Jehovah is the best promise we can ever make. 
nothing will bring you greater delight. And interestingly, when we make that promise to Jehovah, in return, he makes another promise towards us to help us keep our promise. And that's so reassuring. Uh, please note this scripture in Isaiah chapter 41, because Jehovah wants to help us to live our life in accordance to his will. That's uh, Isaiah chapter 41. Notice his promise that he will help you overcome any problem. And as we read this verse, try to imagine that God is speaking directly to you, directly to you. In verse 10, that's Isaiah 41, 10. Do not be afraid, for I am with you. Do not be anxious, for I am your God. I will fortify you. Yes, I will help you. I will really hold on to you with my right hand of righteousness. What a beautiful promise uh, from the God who cannot lie. You know, one married couple loves this scripture so much, they've cut it out and put it on the refrigerator door. And uh, he, the husband says this, when things are particularly difficult, I read the verse and it makes things easier. These words encourage me not to be afraid, what especially strengthens me is Jehovah's assurance that he is beside me so close that it is as if his right arm is hugging me like a close friend. This promise we just read is trustworthy. See, Jehovah will reward you for earnestly seeking him. So continue with your studies of the Bible with Jehovah's Witnesses. We urge you to. And if you're not yet studying the Bible, uh, we encourage you to approach Jehovah's Witness and start your Bible studies or go to the JW.org website and request a home Bible study. Jehovah promises to help you. Do not be afraid. Now, as we read earlier, Jehovah told faithful Abraham, and by means of your offspring, all nations of the earth will obtain a blessing for themselves. Yes, those who exercise faith in God and put their life in Jehovah's hands will be among those who receive a blessing. You too can receive that blessing. It's true, we all have limitations, and sometimes we hesitate to tell others about those limitations. But Jehovah proudly tells us of what he cannot do. He's never done and never will. He cannot lie. He is not a promise breaker. May we be among those who will see the complete fulfillment of Genesis 3.15, that promise. We look forward to the elimination of Satan, his offspring. We look forward, yes, to living in paradise on earth forever. You can be there. We all can be there. How? by exercising faith in the God who cannot lie. 